the impacts that are coming with climate change are, are vast and massive. It was a complete whiteout. Those are 12 foot drifts back there. It was bad, it was really bad. Carlton on the highway, there's a huge accident, a huge Carlton, I'm so scared. It was a matter of life and death for a lot of people. We've always had extreme weather, but over the last 20 years, as climate change has accelerated, it has mutated and become more dangerous and unpredictable. From dry lightning, to the polar vortex, to bomb cyclones, and the fire nado. Welcome to the new reality. Welcome to mutant weather. Cold weather is mutating and breaking records. Intense and ferocious, the cold season is starting earlier, bringing with it increasingly frigid Arctic air and severe snowstorms. This early arrival of Arctic fronts indicates the instability and unpredictability of our weather systems. Winter is changing, evidenced by intensifying phenomena such as nor'easters, bomb cyclones, and frostquakes, phenomena that can be destructive and even deadly. While climate change is most often associated with a warmer planet, it is also responsible for this new kind of mutant winter. As long as climate change accelerates and the planet heats up, the Arctic region's cold air can no longer be contained in the north, and it will only make winters more extreme. I don't think I'm getting to work. What we've always talked about with climate change is that the extremes will become more extreme. It's the extremes that we have to keep an eye on because those are what impact society. We have no reason to believe that extreme weather incidents are not going to get worse in the coming years and decades. All of the science is pointing towards more energy in our atmosphere. And that energy is trapped by carbon dioxide. It provides more fuel, more, more wood for the fire, if you will. So why are winters getting colder if the Earth is getting warmer? The burning of fossil fuels traps greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. These gases act like a blanket around the Earth, holding in the heat and nowhere feels it more than the top of the world. This Arctic warming abrupt climate change is exactly what's triggered the reorganization of heat and cold around the Northern Hemisphere, all promoted by greenhouse gas warming. Clearly, as we see changes in warming up in the polar regions, the weather patterns, not only there, but around the world are going to change. Weather is influenced by the jet stream the atmospheric highways where narrow, fast-moving air currents circle around the globe. The jet stream is one of the most important features in meteorology. It literally governs our weather patterns around the world. There are two belts of streams that span both hemispheres, the polar jet and the subtropical jet. Typically north of the jet stream, temperatures are cooler, and south of the jet stream, they're warmer. And the dividing line or boundary of those different temperature air masses gives us weather. The swirling mass of freezing air over the Arctic is known as the polar vortex. The polar vortex, let me start off explaining what it isn't. It's not an Arctic hurricane, it's not an Arctic tornado. It's a cold front, and its relationship with the warmer jet stream below is what has dictated our normal weather of the past. The colder the polar vortex, the more predictable the weather. But with the warming of the Arctic, the jet stream has mutated. The Arctic is warming twice as fast as the global average. There are feedbacks, features of the climate system in the Arctic that appear to, to amplify or make, make the changes more dramatic. As the Arctic is warming, uh, there's less of a difference between the Arctic temperatures and the tropical temperatures, and that affects the strength of the jet stream. If the jet stream moves even just a little bit, it has a tremendous effect on the weather. So if we have permanent changes in the jet stream, that can mean long-term catastrophic changes in weather patterns that could be absolutely devastating. 
Extreme temperature contrasts between the tropics and the Arctic are what motor the jet streams to zoom around the globe at up to 500 kilometers an hour. But as the north warms, that contrast decreases. And the jet stream becomes wobbly and sluggish. It's a, a very distinct wind system that separates cold air up in the Arctic region. Uh, what we often see is when there's a breach or a weakening in the polar vortex circulation, cold air from the polar region can often intrude down from Canada and into the United States. The rising average temperature has impacted the polar vortex in such a way that it has unleashed brutal extreme cold events that test our infrastructure and threaten our lives. The impacts that are coming with climate change are, are vast and massive. We could have even more severe winters as a result of global climate change. Very few people have been on the front lines of severe winter storms more than veteran meteorologists and storm chasers Jacqueline Whittle and Mark Robinson. They are first-hand witnesses to the massive changes in winters and have stories to tell. The most powerful winter storm that I've ever been in was uh, a nor'easter. Jacqueline, how are you keeping your feet? I'm just trying to stay grounded because these gusts are really picking up and we know that the winds are not. I was in Summerside PEI, Prince Edward Island, and we got so much snow that the snow drifts were so high that they actually met up with the second story windows in our hotel. Those are 12 foot drifts back there. My co-host Jacqueline and I had crossed the street to stand in a mall parking lot, but the wind and the snow kicked up so strongly, all of a sudden, almost out of nowhere, we lost track of each other. We were only a couple of feet away from each other and we couldn't see each other. So I'm yelling at Jacqueline, where are you, Jack? She's yelling back at me. We couldn't figure out which way we were facing, so we didn't know where our hotel was. And we were only 20 feet away. That can get very, very scary when you're dealing with conditions like that. These things are, are very scary, and people that are used to big blizzards like that have been known to actually die on the side of the road because they think, well, I'll walk home, I'm at a friend's house, it's not so bad, it's, it's, not, you know, it's not getting as bad as I think it's going to get. And the visibility gets so bad that they cannot make their way home, they can't find their way home, and they become disoriented, and some have been known to die. With our new mutant weather, severe winter storms always loom as a huge threat. January 2019, Chicago, Illinois is hit by a bone-chilling cold snap and experiences its coldest temperatures in 34 years. A weakened polar vortex causes a peninsula of icy Arctic air to descend down North America and hover over the American Midwest. Oh, God. By the time dark fell on Chicago last night, a snow hurricane was in full force. What begins as a mild January in Illinois suddenly becomes dangerously cold with an onslaught of rogue Arctic air. Perched on the edge of Lake Michigan, Chicago is no stranger to harsh winters, but they are not ready for this kind of mutant cold. When the wind comes from the north, it's going to get colder. Suddenly, you have, as a consequence of warming in the Arctic, increased instability in the climate system. This instability causes Chicago's temperature to drop to minus 23 degrees Fahrenheit. At O'Hare International Airport, wind chill reaches minus 52 degrees Fahrenheit. If any of your skin was exposed, you knew you were at risk. And, you know, it, it is dangerous. Frostbite can occur in as little as 10 minutes when a naked skin is exposed to the elements in a cold snap like what we're experiencing now. A third of the U.S. is affected by this spread of the polar vortex. Whatever we have to Water use layers. to stay warm, I'm using a towel as a scarf. 90 million people experience temperatures of zero degrees Fahrenheit or below, many in places not used to this kind of cold. I think the word cold is not uh, a proper way to define it. It's just unbelievably cold. The temperatures are so extreme that the Midwest is paralyzed. 2,300 flights are canceled. Postal service is suspended, and public schools and colleges are closed. In the region's biggest cities, 
public transit does its best to press on. In Chicago, crews resort to warming railway switches by lighting them on fire to keep them operational. They're gas-powered switch heaters, and it's essentially you're looking at a giant gas grill. These switch heaters are there to keep the switches warm, to keep them from freezing up. They can keep them functioning, keep them flowing, so we can keep the traffic flowing through that area. But it's not over. More ice and snow bear down on an already strained city. Illinois State Police assist over 1,300 motorists in eight hours, 10 times more than usual. The Chicago Fire Department navigated on foot and snowmobiles looking for stranded people hunkered down in their cars. How long have you been in this car? We've been in here um, since around 6 o'clock. PM? Yes. The night before? Yes. Bottom line, a big storm dumping nearly two feet on Chicago and some big challenges in the days ahead for city workers, officials, and residents. Tragically, when the rogue polar vortex retreats a week later, 22 people are dead across Canada and the Midwestern United States. Hodgson, Manitoba, two hours north of Winnipeg. Cold winters are the norm for this farming community. Been situated here since, uh, since I was born, born and raised on this farm. Boyd's son, Jamal, also works on the farm. I'm the fourth generation, so it's been in our family for over 100 years. Uh, and we, we keep uh, about 200, a little over 200 head of cattle at calve and uh, about 300 acres of grain for cash crop, wheat, canola. Farming in Manitoba can be challenging, especially in a province that often experiences severe weather conditions. If you've got livestock, if you're a grain farmer, uh, you, you are working at the mercy of the weather. We've had uh, minus 40s for a, for a long stretch at a time. To calve cattle in the wintertime, as we do, uh, it's hard work. Middle of February is when we start calving, and uh, that's, that's the coldest time of year. Birthing cattle in winter can make the process quite difficult. Despite having uh, electric heat trace in our uh, water troughs, we've had our troughs freeze, and uh, cattle without water at any time is bad. And now, mutant weather is threatening this community. We used to start our, our haying season in, in, uh, in the latter part of June, say the third week of June, and it just seems like now we're way into July before we begin our, our haying harvest. There's no spring. You go from winter to summer and summer to winter. There's no fall, there's no spring. The seasons are shifting. It's an observable phenomenon that seems to be getting more and more extreme. Temperatures in many places worldwide are being affected and a season creep is occurring. Where summers are longer, spring and fall are shorter and winters can arrive earlier with extreme snowstorms and record setting cold temperatures. Lately, Manitoba has fluctuated between harsh extremes. Farmers like Boyd and Jamal have had to contend with either droughts or excessive wet and cold conditions. Well, it, it definitely plays a toll on, on, I think, one's mental well-being, definitely. If you become non-productive because of weather, it's an issue, and of course, the finances fall into that, your, your ability to, to uh, produce uh, your product and sell it and, and pay the bills. Any farmer, whether or not they believe in climate change, they'll, they'll tell you that the weather has changed. They'll tell you that the patterns have changed and that their operation and the strategic planning that goes in their operation has changed because of those changing weather patterns. And in October 2019, these changes are about to get even worse for Boyd and Jamal Abbas when a mutant storm comes calling. It was, it was bad, it was really bad. A breached polar vortex isn't the only effect climate change has on cold weather. The warmer the air is, the more moisture it holds, and that can mean more increased precipitation events, from supercharged hurricanes to massive winter storms like the nor'easter. Similar to hurricanes, nor'easters are a type of cyclone. They develop when the warm air over the Atlantic Ocean and the cold air masses coming down from Canada meet. That sharp contrast develops an intense low-pressure system 
which in turn generates incredibly powerful storms feeding on this difference between the air masses. These storms often bring with them heavy snow, blizzard conditions, and even hurricane force winds. For anyone living in the northeastern part of the United States, you've probably heard the term nor'easter. So a nor'easter is a storm which provides northeasterly winds. It doesn't come from the northeast. A lot of people think that, but the storm is actually moving up the coastline. And as it does so, the counterclockwise circulation around the storm brings northeasterly winds to much of New England or the east coast. So a nor'easter is simply a storm moving towards the northeast, providing northeasterly winds. The strongest nor'easters often occur in the winter months because you have that massive difference in temperature on land versus the temperature over the ocean. The Northeastern United States, January 2018. Conditions are primed for some extremely active weather. In the winter of 2018, the conditions were perfect for nor'easter after nor'easter to go up the east coast. The jet stream was somewhat locked in place right up the entire eastern seaboard. So any storm systems that got going got supercharged and dragged up the entire east coast by the jet stream. With the east coast already in a deep freeze from the polar vortex, a massive nor'easter covers virtually the entire east coast in snow and ice, making it one of the coldest New Year's Eves on record. This storm is going to change the coastline of New England with moderate to major coastal flooding. Winter storms also can bring coastal flooding. So as a storm system moves up perhaps the east coast, it can provide coastal storm surges, which can cause flooding and incredible damage along the coastline. Forecasters say flood levels will rival all-time records because of a recent full moon. Nor'easters are the kitchen sink of storms. They literally throw everything at you, including the kitchen sink. As these storms come up the coast, they're feeding on that warm Atlantic water. That's bringing you rain. At the same time, it's pulling that cold air down from the polar region. That's bringing you snow, so you're getting high winds, huge waves, rain, snow, hail, all kinds of stuff. The nor'easter is bringing a mixed bag of woes to the east coast, a massive tree toppled in high winds, smashing into this home in Kensington, Maryland. A hundred-year-old woman was hurt. Near Richmond, Virginia, another tree trapped four children inside their home. Inland, snow led to treacherous driving conditions overnight in Pennsylvania and New York State, but the brunt of the storm will strike Massachusetts. I can't keep up with it. Once I make one pass, I come back around, the road's already covered with snow. Nor'easters can be dangerous for the same reason that almost any storm is dangerous. You're talking about tremendous amounts of wind, rain, waves. All of these things can serve to make a dangerous environment. If you're driving down the highway in a nor'easter or in any very strong storm. You can be dealing with whiteout conditions. You can be dealing with debris, trees coming down, power lines falling. Any of that can be seriously dangerous for anybody caught outside. 2018, Tallahassee, Florida. The northern part of the Sunshine State is hit by a mutant blizzard. It's the first heavy snowfall in Florida in 30 years. With no snow plows, the storm leaves Florida at a standstill. The storm crawls northward up the east coast. As it travels, it takes on a frightening mutation, the bomb cyclone. A bomb cyclone is a severe meteorological event with hurricane force winds. It can have a pressure equivalent to a category two hurricane, which can bring wind gusts of nearly 100 miles an hour. It's a storm that rapidly intensifies, becoming stronger and more powerful as the pressure at the center of it drops dramatically. The storm spins counterclockwise, creating that cyclone effect. Many times, these storms are actually nor'easters that have intensified and bombed out. If a storm bombs out, we're going uh, through a process called bombogenesis. For a nor'easter to bomb out, it has to drop 24 millibars in 24 hours. And that is extremely rapid intensification for these storms. And that, in turn, will lead to very strong winds and tremendous amounts of rain or snow being produced. 
If temperatures suddenly plummet, this can produce rare phenomena called cryoseisms or frost quakes. When temperatures quickly plunge below freezing, water in the ground turns to ice and expands, increasing pressure on the surrounding area. When pressure becomes too great, a crack breaks out on the surface accompanied by a violent and thundering boom. January 2015. Meteorologist and storm chaser Mark Robinson is in Washington, D.C., monitoring a nor'easter making its way up the East Coast. We thought the storm was going to be strong. We thought it was going to have some serious winds, tremendous amounts of snow, but I was unprepared for what it actually brought to us. When that storm came through, it looked like a white wasteland. Nobody was moving around. There was nobody there, no cars, no people, no plows, nothing. It was eerie. Fallen trees, downed power lines, and extensive road closures littered giant swaths of the U.S. East Coast. I thought that the only way you'd get a storm that strong was to have a hurricane. This was like a cold weather hurricane. The storm forces airlines to cancel multiple flights for three days. Massive power outages stretch from Washington, D.C. to the Canadian Maritimes. You can't get electrical service companies in there to get those lines back up and running in any sort of reasonable time frame. So now you're dealing with people, no heat, no electricity, the potential for freezing, frostbite, hypothermia. It's a very bad situation. So you get people that couldn't get fresh water. They couldn't get groceries. They were trapped in their houses. You had people with medical conditions that needed help that people couldn't get to. So it wasn't just a matter of, oh, I can't get around. It was a matter of life and death for a lot of people. Salida, Colorado, October 2019. A wildfire dubbed the Decker Fire has been burning for a month, ignited by a lightning strike and fueled by dry conditions. But overnight, temperatures take a dramatic dive. 800 firefighters now must contend with extreme fire and ice. So this fire started over a month ago, and it was in wilderness area, lightning strike. We uh, have only been here for uh, about 10 days. So that's when things started getting a little more active and it got closer to the residential area. Yeah, the weather has been uh, pretty crazy over the last week. Um, really warm during the day, cold at night. Um, the last two nights when the cold front pushed through, uh, got really cold and snow actually yesterday. Uh, the cold weather is, um, makes it a lot tougher. Um, not just during the day, at night, we have crews out at night and also sleeping in the cold weather in tents. The weather becomes so cold that special trailers are ordered to provide shelter for the firefighters. Uh, this is one of two uh, sleeper trailers that we brought in to house the firefighters overnight. And it uh, has 42 bunks and a triple layer on each side of the trailer. You can sleep 42 people in here. We needed them to get the people out of the cold weather and get them off the ground, get them sheltered, keep them warm. Firefighters are equipped to work in grueling, dangerous conditions. But sudden, unexpected cold weather can compromise their most prized tool, water. So all the pumps you see are called Mark III pumps, and those have to be drained and prepared for those freezes. And then, let's say a flame front came that morning, we'd have to reconnect everything and get water flowing again. This morning, we had to actually break ice to access that water. Uh, the real challenge is managing our pump uh, because this is a structure engine, and inevitably, if those pipes freeze, it, you know, it's it's not a fire engine anymore. It's just a truck. Last night, you know, probably an hour to get everything drained and, and ensure it was drained, and then this morning, it took us probably another hour to get it filled and and thaw out everything. Uh, so it probably took us about two hours of prep time, whereas most days are more spent on on actual firefighting. The Decker fire burns through 9,000 acres of land and lasts for six weeks before Mother Nature comes to the rescue, dropping four inches of wet snow on the fiery blaze, enough moisture to saturate the area and contain the fire. The Great Lakes. These interconnected lakes along the U.S.-Canadian border hold 20% of the Earth's fresh water. 
They're also home to a cold weather phenomenon known as lake effect snowfall. As the climate warms, the Great Lakes see less ice coverage, leaving more water exposed. This loads the air with more moisture that will freeze into snow. Those winter storms, which contain a lot of heavy precipitation, obviously have to have a lot of moisture. There's the Great Lakes. If you get enough moisture in the right situation, you can get lake effect snow, and that can produce tremendous amounts of snow in a short period of time. Lake effect snow bands can look exactly like a thunderstorm over the water in the middle of winter. And they can even produce thunder and lightning. So they are convective in nature that there's a lot of energy, a lot of rising motion because of that warm water and cold air aloft. The clash of those two air masses is where the storms occur. That's where the cold weather, that's where the cold storms are going to appear. It almost looks like you're seeing a thunderstorm, but instead of rain, you're getting heavy snow. And we can see a lot of heavy, heavy snowfall rates where we're talking about, you know, five to eight centimeters per hour falling. And you could be buried in one of these bands with literally feet of snow, but 10 miles north or south of it, you could have dry pavement. So you little, literally drive into a blizzard and drive right out. It's incredible. A massive snowstorm pummels southern Manitoba. Its severity and ferocity is unprecedented this early in the year. October 2019, Hodgson, Manitoba. Father and son Boyd and Jamal Abbas find themselves caught in the center of the storm. It was a complete whiteout. It, just, this, it was just a heavy, heavy snowfall. It was, yeah, it was a, a virtually zero visibility. I've definitely seen snow in, in October. Nothing like this, though. This kind of wet snow, that brutal cold, that intense wind, no. And it was bone chilling. That, that kind of snow is just bone chilling. The snow that accumulated the, the, the first evening, when we morning, morning came around, it was times three. Everything was covered. There was, you know, uh, I think on the average, it had to be three feet of snow. And on the farm, the extreme weather also impacts the animals. That wet snow, even for cattle, just like for people, it's bone chilling. Under the intense conditions, Boyd and Jamal act fast to try and save their herd. Having that much snow in, in less than 72 hours or whatever, that, that, puts, that puts a lot of stress on the animal. So it's up to the rancher to ensure that their animals are cared for. So bedding is huge, feed is huge. So that was that, that meant hauling the feed out to the animals, which I'm, I'm always prepared to do that, but it was, it was quite challenging. The snow continues to fall with no end in sight. An accumulation of over two feet is in the forecast. Under the weight of heavy, wet snow, thousands of power lines go down, plunging entire communities into darkness with no heat or electricity. The Premier of Manitoba declares a state of emergency. It was something that never occurred before where you had no communications and uh, no ability to, to travel. You felt isolated. Some of the local fuel stations didn't have fuel because they didn't have generators to run their pumps. It was a bad time. The situation becomes so dire that over a dozen First Nations reserves declare their own states of emergency and are forced to evacuate. Not having power, not having gasoline, not having diesel, I can only imagine how stressful that was. So I, I think the fact that they were evacuated says something. There was a reason, because they just, they didn't have any access to anything. The storm wreaks havoc on infrastructure throughout the province. As a result of wet, heavy snow, extremely icy conditions and strong winds, transformers are damaged, steel towers collapse, and wooden hydro poles snap over 260,000 power outage reports come in. The Provincial Electric Power and Natural Gas Utility, Manitoba Hydro, is overwhelmed and calls for assistance from other provinces. Manitoba Hydro had linemen coming from Ontario, from Alberta, poles coming from BC. It was a countrywide effort. I received a call from our mutual assistance director, uh, and he had mentioned that Manitoba uh, got hit with a major storm, and they're looking for assistance. The storm's aftermath is massive. Over 4,000 hydro poles are damaged. It destroys nearly 600 miles of power lines. The crippling power outage leaves 53,000 customers without power. In my career, I've not seen this kind of damage in Canada. 
If you were to picture driving down the highway where you would typically have poles standing erect, I saw the poles snapped in half like toothpicks. That was uh, a very stunning image in my head. With the extreme changes in climate and cold storms becoming more severe and unpredictable, it's very important to study our past climate to help inform the future. People have called me the Iceman. Uh, I guess it's because I've spent months and months over close to 60 expeditions in the Antarctic, the Arctic, high mountains of Asia, the high mountains of the Andes. Paul Majewski is a glaciologist who studies ice core samples. When he started, he had no idea his work would lead to breakthroughs about climate change. I've always said they're a time machine. Trapped year by year is everything that was in the atmosphere. We believed in the 70s, the 80s, all, basically even into the 90s, that places like Antarctica, uh, the Greenland ice sheet, that nothing would ever change, that the ice, it was so cold that it basically maintained its own climate. And it turns out that's not true. When it's working properly, the polar vortex maintains frigid temperatures in the polar extremes of the planet. The cold air that is sequestered here creates a vast repository of information about the global past frozen in the Arctic ice. Dr. Majewski works out of his laboratory. This is one of our freezers where we keep our ice cores. They're from all over the world. Everything from Mount Everest, Antarctica, Greenland, the Himalayas, all over the place. And ice cores are a remarkable tool for understanding past climate and actually past weather too. I like to say glaciers don't lie. Uh, they capture within them everything that's in the atmosphere. You can count year by year just like a tree ring and within each one of those years you can understand a lot about the past climate system. Temperature, precipitation, storm patterns. Probably the most famous ice core that we ever collected went back 110,000 years. Year by year, we collected the ice core from the center of the Greenland ice sheet, and that record was an absolute paradigm changer. This ice core changed the way Dr. Majewski thinks about climate. The deep freeze at the poles was not nearly as stable as he'd always assumed. The major discovery that we made uh, was the realization that the climate could change very rapidly. This is part of that 110,000 year record that we use to understand how the natural climate system changes. It was the record that we discovered abrupt climate change with, and it's the record that we've used to show how different a modern climate is because of humans uh, as compared to the last 110,000 years. And now uh, we're seeing that humans have actually created such high levels of greenhouse gases that they're unprecedented in at least the last one million years. This is primarily CO2 uh, and methane. And in the case of CO2, the levels of CO2 have risen 100 times faster in the last few decades than they have in the last probably million years. So humans have put the climate on speed. The impact of climate change caused by humans has led to mutant weather events like the severe winter storms that are occurring more and more unexpectedly and often much earlier than anticipated. And now our tampering with the equilibrium of the climate system has grave consequences for information stored in the planet's glaciers. And once it's gone, there's no way to reconstruct it. As ice melts, we're definitely losing these amazing archives. So it's a real race. Uh, to get to every single place where these unbelievable records are preserved. There's no other way of understanding past climate other than ice cores, and these are a super valuable archive. They're the Rosetta Stone of paleoclimate. The past is the key to the future. All these ice core records help decipher how the climate has changed because of what we're doing to the planet right now. They are a warning the climate has exponentially changed in the last few decades and that we may have already altered our planet forever. Southern Manitoba, a mutant October snowstorm leaves a trail of destruction in its wake. Tens of thousands are without power and assistance from across Canada is arriving to help. The weather brought in a lot of extreme cold, extreme wind conditions. 
and cost a lot of people to be out of power for days. It meant that there may be individuals that have um, life support systems at home that cannot, that have backup power that only lasts so many days. With bone chilling temperatures, the pressure is on to get power up and running, but the crew has faced tough challenges. The working conditions were quite icy, lots of snow. The weather poses a risk to workers and their ability to restore power. Ice builds on the electrical cables, also known as conductors, and weighs them down. When you have a lot of icy conditions, the conductors become heavy, and when wind picks up, it creates this condition that rips the conductor out of the poles and snaps the poles. When one pole snaps, it just creates a cascading effect where the conductors on the next pole fall, and it just takes down all of these poles and conductor puts it on the ground, creating dangerous situations. The most difficult situation is when you're out in the middle of nowhere through the woods with every pole snapped in half to the ground, and now you're wondering how you're going to restore power uh, through that section. But more and more treacherous circumstances await Leo and his crew. The most extreme conditions my crew was working in was at the Dauphin River crossing. Uh, there was this particular island where they had approximately 37 uh, poles. Most of it was damaged, and my crews were in waist-deep bog. Uh, trying to move things around, trying to put anchors in, and restoring the, uh, restoring the line. Farmer Boyd Abbas, his family, and neighbors wait for hydro crews to come and restore power. Days pass, and the situation turns dire for some. And uh, one neighbor uh, lives by herself, has MS, and uh, she did not want to leave her, her, her dwelling. So I'd, I'd take her food every day, and uh, on the fourth day, the poor thing uh, had to be taken out, taken out. She was crying and her face was, <laughs> was a little bit blue. It takes two weeks to restore power in Manitoba at an estimated cost of over $100 million. The farming community is amongst the hardest hit. And uh, whatever crop was left out there was, uh, is, is probably not going to get retrieved and harvested. So there's, there's losses big time. There's a financial cost. Your equipment is gonna suffer, your land is gonna be impacted. I know several farms, several neighbor, neighboring farms. They grew a ton of soybeans, but then all of a sudden the snow came. A, a whole five feet of it. So that destroyed the crop, you know? So it's frustrating, you don't know what to do. We most definitely see more extreme weather conditions rolling throughout more frequently over the past decade. We're seeing more snowstorms and more adverse wind conditions. Mutant weather means the possibility of more extreme cold weather events happening with greater frequency and at unexpected times of the year. What stayed with me the most after returning from Manitoba is the realization that all it takes is that one storm for your entire distribution circuit to snap like toothpicks. And what's most important is being prepared every day for that day. I think the weather event uh, that we had could could happen again. I think climate change is, is definitely uh, something that's, that's, uh, that we all have to be cautious of and try and do our part, I suppose, in, uh, in preventing such a thing. Climate change is impacting our Earth at a rapidly increasing pace. You often hear climate scientists talk about tipping points, uh, these things that happen that they don't go back to what they were. One thing we know for sure is that climate change is going to have some sort of impact on severe weather. This is evident in our ever-changing winters. Brutal storms with hurricane force winds, multiple feet of snow and extreme freezing cold are now occurring earlier and earlier and with more frequency. As these devastating cold weather storms mutate in their frequency and intensity, we're also seeing a disruption in the seasons, especially winter. The way that the winters are occurring is changing. Winter is the time of year where the cold allows dormancy all across the northern part of the planet. That winter season really is a way for Mother Nature to kind of put a cap on things. But if that cap is gone, there'll be problems ahead over the coming decades. What it is going to do is move those storms, move that winter into places that we don't normally expect. So we're going to still get those nor'easters, but where they go and what they do, that may be changing. 
what it's doing is disrupting things on a much grander scale, and it's worrisome long term. Global warming is a reality. As the world continues to warm and temperatures rise, the polar vortex is becoming ever more unstable. That in turn has disrupted and weakened the jet stream. Jet stream patterns govern worldwide weather. A more erratic jet stream can allow cold Arctic air to make its way down, leading to more extreme and unpredictable cold weather events. Mutant weather means storms like nor'easters and bomb cyclones could hit earlier and more frequently in the coming years. These dangerous winter storms have real-life consequences, shutting down cities, disrupting infrastructure, and plunging millions of people into freezing and deadly conditions. I can appreciate the beauty of a winter storm, but there is an ugly side to it. When you put humans in front of it or in the path of it, it's going to produce the potential for devastation. The impacts of these extreme weather events can be catastrophic. People can lose their lives, they can lose their homes, they can lose their businesses. I am worried. I really am worried. Um, I think that these storms are so destructive, you know, as they already are, and if things were to get worse over the next 100 years, that could be really bad. This is especially true in areas of the world that aren't used to extreme cold and severe winter storms. They aren't set up with the infrastructure or the resources to deal with record-setting frigid temperatures or potentially deadly snowstorms. In my opinion, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to adapt to these extreme conditions. Disproportionately, the discussion on climate change has focused on uh, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions and how do we lower greenhouse gas emissions, and that's a good discussion to have. But what we've had very little discussion on is how do we adapt to extreme weather events. With an ever-changing climate, how will humans respond to the threat of extreme cold weather? Given the formidability of the challenge of, of climate change, which it can seem very, very daunting when it's laid out to you, uh, some people will argue, well, if, you, if, you, if you're too forthright with the presentation of the challenge, people will just throw up their arms and give up. But if you put it into palliative terms that it just sugarcoats it, then they won't act either. To me, it's an ethical dilemma. I mean, we, we've known for many years now that we're impacting our, our Earth's climate, our environment on a, on a global scale. And we need to take care that we don't take up more of the Earth's resources than, uh, uh, than our fair share and, uh, and to be sustainable. My personal view is that we should present the reality as it exists. We shouldn't over or understate the formidability of the challenge. And hopefully people will rise to the challenge. The question remains, are we too late? Have we reached a climate tipping point from which there is no return? Climate change is the biggest security issue of the 21st century uh, because it is something that impacts everybody on the planet. We've only seen the beginning of it, and it will cause more disruption to civilization, certainly, uh, than wars we've experienced in the last couple of decades. We're talking about the future of our, our habitat, our home. And if your home is on fire, you do something about it. But if you deny that your home is on fire, bad things happen. Every part of this planet is recording different kinds of changes that are associated with climate change right now. There's nowhere you can go across the entirety of the planet that you won't be able to observe some kind of change. With the new reality of destructive cold winter storms and all mutant weather, our next steps as a species become ever more crucial in the coming years. As individuals start to feel and experience those changes and see how that's going to impact their life, I think that that's how we start to mobilize people and to bring them to the table. If we can get everybody together and make changes, then I think we will be able to reverse uh, or at least mitigate the, the damage that we're doing. So I'm hopeful in that regard. You've got two choices. You either stand up and fight and fight hard or you lay down and just give up. To my mind, climate change and the formidability of the challenge should be in the realm of a call to arms. It should invigorate us to, to try that much harder. If you care about your family, your community, the food that you ate as a child, the places that you swam in, the mountains that you skied on, if you care about all these things, you have to care about climate change and you have to do it now because the window of opportunity is closing 
for us to maintain a livable planet.